Scholastic Audio presents I Survived the Children's Blizzard, 1888. Book 16 of the I Survived series by Lauren Tarshish. Read by Andrew Iden. Chapter 1 January 12th, 1888 Prairie Creek, Dakota Territory Around 10 a.m. A deadly blizzard raged across the prairie and 11-year-old John Hale was trapped in a frozen nightmare. The wind screamed in his ears as he staggered through the blinding snow. His whole body was numb. The monster storm had come out of nowhere. A massive black cloud moving faster than a train. The temperature plunged. The wind howled. And then... Roar! The sky exploded like a bomb, blasting snow and ice through the air. Ground-up ice raked John's eyes like tiny claws. The furious wind pounded him, tore at him, spun him around. He felt like he was locked in a cage with a furious beast trying to rip him to pieces. And then a screaming gust picked John up and slammed him down. He tried to rise to his feet, but the wind was too strong. Snow was piling on top of him, burying him in an icy grave. John felt his flesh freezing on his bones. His body's warmth was seeping out of him like blood leaking from an open wound. John had never wanted to move west, to this wide open prairie. He was a city kid, not a tough pioneer. And now the manic wind was hissing in his ears, taunting him. You're weak. You'll never make it. You're doomed. That terrifying, evil wind was the last sound John heard as he was buried alive. Chapter 2 about four months earlier, September 19th, 1887, Prairie Creek, Dakota Territory, 7.45 a.m. John's little sister Franny had disappeared. She and John were on their way to their schoolhouse. They were halfway through the three-mile walk from their farm. They were following an old wagon trail that cut through the tall, golden grass. Franny, who was five, had been skipping up ahead. John had been watching her blonde braids flap up and down like the wings of a happy yellow bird. Somehow he'd lost sight of her. John sped up, looking all around. It was hard to see through the grass, which rose up so high it tickled his neck. A unicorn could be prancing by and John wouldn't notice. Franny, he shouted. Where are you? Whoosh, said the wind. Swish, said the grass but no sign of Franny. John sighed. She must be playing hide-and-seek, her favorite game. When Franny found a good spot, she'd sit there forever. She was going to make them late. It was hard enough for John going to school where he had no friends, but his teacher, Miss Rule, was mean. He pictured her now, her hair stretched back in a bun, her eyes glaring through her little round glasses. She was young and barely five feet tall, but she ruled over the schoolhouse like a Civil War general. John had never once seen her smile. When kids were late, Miss Rule made them stay in for recess and memorize some boring poem. Torture. Franny, John shouted. He stood on his tiptoes, peering into the distance. All he could see in any direction was wide open prairie. It seemed to stretch out forever, an ocean made of grass. He still couldn't get used to it, all this empty land. John and Franny and their parents had moved here to Dakota about a year ago, from Chicago. It wasn't John's idea. He'd been happy living in the city. But Ma and Pa were fed up with their dark little apartment, their cursing neighbors, and the noise and stink that rose up from the street. For years, Ma and Pa had been talking about moving out west and buying a farm. 
But John always figured that was just their crazy dream, like John wishing he could be a pitcher for the Chicago White Stockings, his favorite baseball team. Pa didn't make much money, working at a cabinet shop. How could they ever afford to buy land for a farm? Then Ma and Pa heard they could get land in a place called Dakota. It was thousands of miles of open space, west of Minnesota. Dakota wasn't a state, but it would be soon, folks said. And the government wanted farmers to come. They were even giving away big plots of land for free. All you had to do was build a farm and stay for five years. Then the land was yours, forever. For Ma and Pa, it was a dream come true. We're heading west, Pa boomed. We'll be pioneers, Ma said. John hoped the West would be like the places in his favorite adventure stories, with rivers filled with gold nuggets and brave sheriffs chasing after famous bank robbers like Billy the Kid. Ma and Pa sold practically everything they owned. They traveled West by train. It took seven days to reach the edge of Dakota Territory. Then they bought a rickety wagon and an ox to pull it. John named the ox Shadow, after his favorite white stockings pitcher, Shadow Pile. It was a two-day ride to the little town of Prairie Creek, if you could call it a town. Only about 20 families lived there, on little farms scattered across the prairie. The main street was a dusty strip of dirt with a general store on one side and a hardware store and tiny hotel on the other. John's family settled on a 160-acre piece of land about two miles outside of town. There were no rivers of gold, no brave sheriffs, there wasn't even a bank for a guy like Billy the Kid to rob. There was only empty space and endless work. John and Pa were sometimes out in the fields from dawn until dark. Ma hardly ever stopped scrubbing and cooking and sweeping. Franny's scrawny little arms had sprouted muscles from hauling buckets of water from the well. And the weather. The roasting summer sun. The thunderstorms that blackened the skies. Winter days so cold your spit froze before it hit the ground. Blizzards that came out of nowhere. Last winter, the snow piled up almost to their rooftop. Pa had to dig a tunnel to get from the house to the barn. But for John, the worst part was the emptiness. He got a lonely feeling when he looked out over the prairie, an ache inside him. It felt like a cold wind blowing right through his chest. John didn't belong here. He felt stranded in the middle of nowhere. And now Miss Rule was going to punish him for being late. Franny! But wait, what if Franny wasn't playing a game? She could have wandered too far into the grass and gotten lost. Last year, a little boy from town disappeared. One minute he'd been chasing jackrabbits behind his family's house. The next minute, he'd vanished. John and Pa joined the big search, but the poor kid was never found. It was like the prairie had opened its grassy jaws and swallowed him whole. John cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled at the top of his lungs. Franny! The grass swished. The wind moaned. A flock of geese honked across the bright blue sky. But no sign of Franny. Chapter 3 John was at the edge of panic when a giggle rose from the grass just a few yards ahead. Franny's freckled face popped up. She grinned at him. Boo! Franny! Tricked you! She said. You didn't trick me, John lied. I knew exactly where you were hiding. How did you know? Franny asked with a frown. I could smell you, John said, wrinkling his nose. You stink worse than Princess. Princess was their cow. Franny had picked her name. Actually, Franny smelled a little like apples and Ma's soap, but John needed to get even with her for scaring him. Franny's smile fell away. Her eyes started to tear up. I do not stink, she said. All right, John said. He hated to see Franny sad. But don't do that again. I thought I lost you, Fran. You scared me. Franny burst out laughing. That's a funny joke, Johnny, 
she said. I know you're never scared. John's heart lifted a little. It was good having a little sister who thought he was brave. They rushed the last mile to the schoolhouse, which was about a quarter mile past Main Street. It was just a small, unpainted building, more like an overgrown dollhouse than a school. The school was barely big enough to fit all 15 students. The big and little kids squeezed together in the one room. Miss Rule had to figure out how to teach all of them. Luckily, John and Franny weren't late. The schoolhouse door was still closed. Kids were milling around outside, waiting for the bell. Franny went to join a jump rope game. John looked around, wishing he had someone to talk to. Back in Chicago, he had more friends than he could count. Before school, he and his pals would shoot marbles or bug the girls they liked. But here, there were only three boys his age, Rex, Peter, and Sven. They'd been friendly to John last fall when he was brand new, but John always felt uneasy around them, afraid he would say something wrong and make a fool of himself. So he avoided them. Now they mostly ignored John, or maybe it was John who ignored them. He wasn't sure. But what did it matter? He'd missed his chance. And anyway, they probably knew John didn't belong here. He had nothing in common with those tough pioneer boys. Peter and Sven were standing nearby, rubbing the sleep from their eyes. But then Rex came sprinting toward them, and Peter and Sven perked right up. Rex wasn't funny like Peter, and he didn't have big muscles like Sven. He was quiet and serious. But Rex was their leader without a doubt. His family had been in Dakota longer than anyone. Rex skidded to a stop, huffing and puffing. I found him, Rex exclaimed, wiping the sweat from his forehead. Found who? asked Peter. King Rattler, Rex burst out. The boys gasped. John's ears pricked up. King Rattler was a huge rattlesnake that all the 